Driven. Hello everyone, this is Data Driven Chat and today I'm really excited to have Rachel Tatman with us. So Rachel is a developer advocate from RASA. Uh, she works on conversational AI. She has a PhD in linguistics from the University of Washington and she's also Kegel Notebooks Grandmaster. So hello Rachel. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks a lot. Thanks for doing this. So thanks for finding the time. So um, this this podcast uh, is usually for people who are aspiring data scientists, and um, you work in data science and you work in in, in AI. And um, we heard many different stories of how people get into data science. So can you tell us your personal story? How did you get into data science? Yeah. Um, so when I uh, went into grad school, I was in a linguistics department, but I knew I was interested in natural language processing and computational linguistics. And I also knew I was potentially interested in going into industry. So um, linguistics, like many fields, produces way more PhDs than it has <laughs> jobs for. Um, and also, I, I was recently going back through some of my grad school application materials because somebody had asked me a question about it. Um, and they were all about building language technology that was really um, equitable and helped people and made the world a better place. And now I get to you know, work on that a little bit more directly rather than like, my research helps inform people who will eventually work on those products sort of thing. Um, so I, I'd, even while I was, was an academic researcher, I knew I was definitely interested in industry. And when I started grad school in 2012, uh, data science was not a field yet. Um, but I was doing a lot of um, statistical analysis and I was really interested in learning and sort of modeling learning in humans. Uh, and because I was interested in modeling and, and um, you know, creating, um, you know, sort of workable ways of understanding learning that could be applied to natural language processing and computational linguistics, I took a lot of statistics courses. Um, and I was very lucky because the University of Washington has um, an interdisciplinary department for computational, CSSSS, <laughs> computational social science and statistics. Mm -hmm. No, the Center for, for Statistics and Social Science, I think. Anyway, I only ever referred to it by the acronym. Mm -hmm. um, so I had the opportunity to take some um, courses in Bayesian statistics and causal modeling, which I still think is just so cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and really um, learn a lot about statistical methods and machine learning methods. And um, when I was finished, I um, was on the academic job market. So I was, I was very interested in being a professor. Um, but at the same time, I was also applying to industry jobs. And Meg Rizdahl, who um, was at Kaggle at that time, and then she left to go to Stack Overflow, and now she's back at Kaggle, um, posted that they were looking for um, uh, people to work at Kaggle. And uh, there were sort of like a, a number of places where you could work. And one of the places was Seattle. And I was in Seattle. I was like, oh, that's very, uh, <laughs> uh, very fortuitous. So I applied. Um, and I actually started as a contractor. And then after I think about a year and a half, maybe I converted to full time. So um, Kaggle's owned by Google. So I went through the, the Google interview process, which was a little rough. Um, and actually, my my job title was not data scientist. My job title was developer advocate. Mm -hmm. So uh, developer advocates are, uh, it's a really diverse set of roles and responsibilities. Uh, but basically, you serve as sort of a technical peer interface between a product and users. Um, so the product is developer focused. So in the case of Kaggle, I um, help people use notebooks and um, the datasets platform. I never really worked on competitions. Um, and now at Raza, which is a conversational AI um, framework, which is, which is open source, by the way, if you just want to mm -hmm. go play with it, you can. Yeah, I was going to um, ask you about that. That, that was that was really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's I'm I'm a huge fan of Raza. Uh, <laughs> maybe obviously because I work there. Um, so yeah, so I was sort of working with users and um, and also um, on the product team as sort of like a I I, some, I think sometimes I would refer to myself as like a pet user. <laughs> like I just sort of like hung around and was like, hey, I want this to be different for these reasons um, and offering product feedback and, and sort of synthesizing community feedback as well. Um, so 
throughout all of that, I was doing data science, right? Because you're not, um, in order to be a developer advocate, you have to be a developer, in this case, sort of a data scientist, um, so that you can, you know, uh, answer people's questions and, and understand what their needs are and, you know, really, really test the product before before it mm -hmm. launches, ideally. So that was my sort of weird security, circuitous journey into uh, data science and industry. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, I think first of all, you can always go back to academia. Like I, I can tell you I was kind of in and out and <laughs> you know, eventually I think currently the remuneration packages in, uh, you know, private sector are such that, you know, academia is not always a very competitive place. So mm. yeah, a lot of people tend to go, you know, do like a year and then come back and then you do a couple of years so you might come back to academia who knows um, so definitely I think it's something to always keep in mind but yeah I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about Rasa because I am um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I looked it up <laughs> before the interview. <laughs> to be honest, I never heard of, uh, heard of it, which is kind of, it's, it's my fault. Uh, but, you know, I, I noticed that, yeah, you have some really cool clients like Adobe, but at the same time, it's open source. So I'm just, just can you just uh, give us like a brief taster of what, what, what it is for those people who have never heard about Rasa before? Yeah. Um, so I'd say if you're not building, you know, virtual assistants or, or chatbots or conversational AI, there's no real reason you would have heard of <laughs> so, Um It's a pretty, it's a pretty specialized, um, pretty specialized project. So um, we have an open source conversational AI library, um, as sort of the the core of Raza, and then um, our our approach is a little bit different from a lot of sort of the other conversational AI options out there. Um, so one of our core things is conversational driven development. And that's this idea that the way that you're going to build a system that can effectively converse with people is you'll sort of build the bones of it, like a prototype. Um, and then you will, as soon as possible, get it in front of test users and then use those conversations to uh, improve the quality of your assistant over time. So rather than sort of building like a, a decision tree that maps out all mm -hmm. of the different, um, ways that a conversation can go, we have a much more flexible um, transformer-based architecture that can, you know, select the next option based on the entire conversational history. So it's better able to handle things like digressions or like people changing topics and switching back and forth. Um, so Raza open source is completely free to use. We also have another free to use but not open source project uh, called Raza X, which is an interface on top of Raza open source. So once you've deployed your assistant and you're getting all these conversations in, Raza X provides a really nice way for you to go through and correct things and annotate things. And um, we're also really big on CI CD, so continuous mm -hmm. integration and continuous deployment. Um, so train new models uh, and immediately deploy those models and do version control so you can roll back if you want to. Um, and then if you are, say, a business <laughs> like mm -hmm. Adobe um, and you wanted um, additional features, uh, Raza X Enterprise is the thing that people pay for. Um, so if you are working on like a large assistant, you need, say, a support package or um, the additional features that are really only useful for you if you if you are an enterprise and you're working on a large team with a lot of other people, um, then you would you would come talk to us and, and get, you know, the whole the whole <laughs> deal. But um, Raza open source is open source and then Raza X is free to use but not open source. So that's the sort of yeah, sounds, exciting. Of sounds exciting. So it's like uh, mm. Rasa X is like Rasa on steroids uh, <laughs> with all the yeah with with, uh, with all this. Yeah, it's it's really cool. Um, so um, again, for uh, um, uh, you know, uh, I think everybody who is doing Kaggle competitions <laughs> know you. But for those people who haven't uh, kind of seen your work before. Um, if you had to pick one most important thing, that's something that you are particularly proud of, um, mm. that you have achieved during your career, what would it be? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I feel like the real, the real things that I've achieved in my career have been this is going to sound weird, but inside other people. <laughs> so I'm really, I'm really in sort of a, almost a teaching position. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm, uh, I'm not like a, a full-time professor or anything, but mm -hmm. I, like, my goal is to help people do better and build better, build better, um, language technology. 
And uh, I think the the things that I'm most proud of are when people like and message me and they're like, hey, I watched your video. It was so helpful. And look at this cool thing I built. And that's what um, that's what really, you know, gets me up in the morning. So I would say other people's success, <laughs> other people's successful projects is, is the thing that I'm most proud of. Um, sounds, sounds and, and being able to help with that. Yeah, sounds really, really great. Yeah, and we, yeah, we discussed on this podcast uh, the importance of role models and mm-hmm. um, and mentorship. And uh, I think you provide that to a lot of people. And um, yeah, I can uh, I can understand how it's very grat- gratifying, probably. <laughs> so um, you are a notebook, uh, notebook skagel grandmaster. Uh, mm-hmm. And not only that, but you are the first uh, female <laughs> to, 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 to achieve this title. Uh, at least that's what I heard. Uh, uh, so um, uh, can you tell people who are not, I mean, again, we have, uh, I think anybody who is kind of serious about data science probably <laughs> knows about Kegel. But let's just assume that we have someone who is uh, aspiring uh, data scientist who has never heard about Kegel. What does it mean? What does it mean to, to be a grandmaster? How do you get the title? What is Kegel? And, you know, what does Kegel do? Can you just give us a very, very brief introduction again for those people who never heard about it? Yeah, absolutely. So Kaggle is a online data science platform, and it started as data science competitions. So supervised machine learning, um, everyone got the same data set, everyone tried different things, whoever um, did the best on a hidden test set uh, would win some sort of prize. And over time, those prizes have gotten bigger and bigger, and there have been more and more competitors, and the data sets have gotten bigger, and everything's gotten sort of more complex and harder. so that's the competitions part of it. There's also a hosted Jupyter notebook environment um, and a data sets platform so you can share data, um, which at least when I uh, when I was at Kaggle was uh, probably the most popular part of the platform um, was data set sharing. Mm-hmm. And then um, uh, there's a really active forum and community as well. So it's um, sort of like a, a social network like, um, I don't know, TikTok or Vine, except <laughs> instead of short videos, you do data science. Yeah, yeah awesome. And then uh, what, what, um, uh, uh, how do you get a, uh, how, how do you get the title? Uh, can you tell us how, I know that's very difficult. So you need to get, what, 15 medals to get, uh, to get the notebooks title or is it, uh, am I, am I wrong there? Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm actually pulling it up in a, in a page cause I, I tend to forget. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, there are three different ways that you can become, you can, you can sort of gain titles. Mm-hmm. Um, so one is competitions and you win competitions and that's how you, know, when you win won a certain number of competitions with certain rankings, um, you, you become a competitions grandmaster. Um, I actually don't know that I've ever entered a competition other than the Titanic getting started one. Um, Mm -hmm. I just, I'm not motivated by that. Like I want to try one thing and see if it works. And then once it works, okay, I'm done with it. (laughs) Sort of my, I'm very, I'm very utilitarian. Mm -hmm. Um, I I don't have the sort of like optimization drive. Um, And there are data sets. So getting up votes on your data set. And then there are um, competitions, competitions. I already said that there's uh, notebooks Notebooks, Uh, and so for uh, to become a notebooks grandmaster, you need to get 15 gold medals, mm-hmm. which means that 15 of the notebooks that you've shared have gotten um, a certain number of upvotes from people who are contributor and above. Um, so basically, if you create a new Kaggle account, um, there's a little checklist of things you need to do. Uh, once you finish that checklist of things, you become a contributor. And at that point, you can vote and your votes will count. Before then, you can vote, but your votes won't count. So if mm-hmm. just like people who are logging into Kaggle for the first time really like your your content, you're unfortunately <laughs> not going to get medals. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so it's 15 gold medals for uh, uh, notebooks. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry, there's a, there's a fourth one, discussions. If people really like the things that you say on the forums. Oh, um, cool. And that's, again, a number of, <laughs> of upvotes from non-experts. I completely, completely blanked that. 
Oh, that's interesting. So you can also get it for, for talking about it. I didn't, I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, so and uh, can it? Uh, uh, so obviously there are a lot of different platforms where you can do competitions and you can do learning. Uh, like uh, I, you know, we at the Alan Turing Institute have a number of those as well. Uh, I know Google does them, Facebook does them. So what is the um, particular benefits of Kegel over other platforms or other? benefits like why why kegel like why did you like look at it and think oh you know this is this is where i want to you know make my mark mm-hmm. um well i mean they were hiring so that was <laughs> that was good um yeah, yeah, yeah. no uh so kegel in particular i think the um, the thing that makes it different is its community which is so i mentioned there's like very active discussion forums there's you know it's not just the competitions um but the kegel community is I, I would lovingly compare them to ferrets. I love ferrets, so this is just a very um, uh, this is a flattering comparison. But ferrets, no matter how well you think you've hidden something, ferrets will find it and like drag <laughs> it out and be like, "Look what I found!" <laughs> um, so the the Kaiwo community is extremely motivated, extremely smart, very good at finding things out. Um, so one of the sort of the more challenging things about working at Kaiwo, which is not something that I did is preparing competitions and making sure that there's no leakage because if there's any leakage at all, if there's any public data anywhere that even tangentially relates to the competition, Kaglers will find it. They're extremely motivated, extremely smart, like I said, um, and will will absolutely discover things. Mm-hmm. So that's the... Uh, I think that's really one of the things that makes Kaggle a little bit different from, from other platforms is this just like... There are people who you know, work their job and then come home and basically their second job is just Kaggle competitions because they enjoy it so much, mm-hmm. um, which is great. It's a, it's a great community to work with. Yeah, sounds, uh, sounds awesome. So, um, yeah, um, I also wanted to ask you can, can several questions about skill, mm-hmm. skills and skill set and what do you need to mm-hmm. be a data scientist. So um, some, of, some of my students and some of the people who listen to this podcast are actually executives, so executive students. So normally mm-hmm. they, they have, um, you know, industrial experience. Uh, they are kind of C-level executives or... Um, you know, they, they, they kind of were given certain, <laughs> certain types of jobs within the organization. And uh, they're not, they do not always possess the ability to code. And um, mm-hmm. it's a big investment. You know, if you want to learn data science, it is a big investment. And mm-hmm. um, uh, the, the question that I often get is how important is the ability to code and other technical skills for someone who kind of is trying to get into you know, in, into working with data science and AI. Yeah. And what is more important to kind of have this basic knowledge of math and stats or to actually um, be able to code in a particular language, right? Which we, we've seen quite a few. I mean, I, I, um, you are a lot younger than me, but I've seen, I think I started when QBasic was was a big deal. <laughs> and, and then we kind of transitioned into C, then C++, and C++, and, <laughs> and now we have Python. Well, we have R and Python, but like now I'm, for example, learning Julia. And I think in, mm. in the next few years, there will be something else, I'm sure. So, yeah. So in, in, in your view, like what is like... What 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 is what is more important? I guess math and stats or, or coding, and is it important to learn how to code, or can you kind of swing around <laughs> this <laughs> without? It? So you still can still work in with AI uh, and with data science without much knowledge of coding. Yeah, I would say. Uh, so sort of at the executive level, um, I would say that math and stats are probably more important. Um, so what I would want um, as, so sort of like moving up my management chain, what I would want as a data scientist. So mm-hmm. my immediate manager, I want uh, to have not necessarily, um, I don't necessarily need them to be an IC or an individual contributor and code full time, uh, but I do need them to have an understanding of how thing, long things are likely to take so that we can have realistic timelines. Um, and if you don't have coding experience, those timelines are a little bit more difficult to produce because um, you you sort of have like to develop those ideas of like what's going to be complex, what's not going to be super complex, what's going to take a long time, what's not going to take a long time. Um, so a good example there, you might think um, just sort of naively that uh, preparing the data to go into the model is going to be much faster than 
building the model and sort of like iterating through it and really making sure that it's good. Um, when uh, I think people who've spent more time working with data science will be like, oh, no, 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 the data preparation is going to be the bulk <laughs> of the work, uh, which I think if, if you're in a, a data science program, you've probably discovered, yeah, yeah, <laughs> if no. only from other people's complaining. Yeah, and data um, quality, right? So uh, mm-hmm. it's important. Like, I think a lot of executives do not understand that the uh, uh, models c- come from, they don't kind of drop from earth, like you need to train them. <laughs> and, yes. You know, if you don't have good quality data to train your, to, to train your model, then you have a problem, you know, <laughs> and, they, and they always yep. think, oh, you know, we're just going to grab this data, like we've got this data, right? And, and then you're thinking, yeah, well, that's not going to work <laughs> with this data. Yeah, that's definitely... <laughs> Mm-hmm. You no, know, that's a challenge in the field. And I definitely want my immediate manager to know that. Um, but sort of like going up maybe two, three, four levels. Um, I think it's because I my hope is that my manager would be able to like communicate up, you know, oh, hey, this is going to take a while. Don't expect instant results. Um, what I would expect from sort of like C-level leadership is um, a knowing what types of problems are good applications of, um, let's say, computer vision. What's a good computer vision application? Um and what is not going to work, right? What's going to be sort of like a nonsensical question? So all of these, um, I'm sure, sure you've, you've run into these, these sort of like uh, programs that claim to detect whether or not someone's a criminal based on a picture of their face. Um, yeah, yeah. My favorite, That's... my favorite, I, I call this uh, bollocks du jour, <laughs> AI bollocks du jour. <laughs> and uh, my favorite uh, example, I don't know about yours, is this... Um, paper that came out um, on uh, about homosexual detecting homosexuality mm-hmm. based on uh, photos but the problem mm-hmm. is that the training set was uh, tinder data which like when you go on tinder you're probably not exactly hiding your sexuality i mean like mm-hmm. you you're going <laughs> there for a particular purpose and yeah i mean and to then claim that oh you know what like we're going to predict <laughs> whatever based on whatever pictures <laughs> Is, is is really uh, you know is an overkill yes yeah, so that's so definitely <laughs> I'm there yeah. with you yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I expect from C-level leadership is to like look at a project proposal like that and be like, no, that's ridiculous. That's like humans can't do this. There's no evidence that the signal exists. Your attempt to extract it is just going to be meaningless and expensive. Don't do it. Um, and also the ability to evaluate models. So I would expect like someone at C-level to be who who is directly managing data scientists and making making decisions to be able to like know the difference between sensitivity and specificity, um, be able to ask like intelligent questions about false positive rates and evaluating models. Um, and I, you don't need to code for that. You, you just need to have a good understanding of sort of statistics and, and the way that models can fail. Um, so I, I would definitely say you don't need to code to manage data scientists. Some po- At some point, somebody in the command chain does need to code um, to, again, just develop realistic timelines and sort of understand the work that needs to be done. But if you're not directly managing coders, I don't think you necessarily need to. Especially like you man- mentioned, because it changes real fast. Like, mm-hmm. um, God, when I started learning Python, it was Python 2, and then I had to relearn a bunch of stuff because it was Python 3, <laughs> and I still make dumb mistakes around that, and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, um, I agree with you completely, and uh, yeah, I think that there is... Um, um, yeah, I think there's also I th- when we when we teach people how to you know when we teach people data science we often teach them how to code but really what we need to teach them is algorithmic thinking is how do you build an algorithm. Um, I think that's the most important thing. Like if you <laughs> if you can't if you can, if you don't understand how the algorithm is built and it doesn't you know the coding will not help you. Like it will be bullshit anyway. Like yeah, it will be a lot of cool lines of code, but. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you still need to understand, you know, where you're getting getting in the end. So, um, um, so we've talked about kind of the you know the coding, and uh, yeah, I want to continue uh, this theme about a skill set. So uh, let's just say I'm a complete. Uh, dummy like I don't know much about <laughs> uh, data science so where do I start where do I start learning uh, so if I'm some if I'm just a person who wants to get into data science so where do I start should I take some uh, online courses should I take a you know degree course maybe or should I find a practical problem to solve so what would be your recommendation yeah I mean I 
<laughs> it was probably a little bit of, of bias on my part, but um, the way that I learned data science, I found very motivating. Um, and that was I collected data for my problems, my research problems, my PhD, and I needed to analyze it. So I was extremely motivated to finish the analysis because I needed to finish the program mm. and hit my milestones where I would not be paid money for food. Um, <laughs> So I would recommend starting with data collection, which I realize is not usually the, the thing that people recommend. Um, but I think starting with data collection gives you a good idea of what's actually going on in data and ways that it can be wrong and ways that it can be fallible. And also will start to give you the tool set to look at a data set and be like, wait, that doesn't look right, um, which is one of the most important parts of data science and one of the hardest things to train is to figure out, wait, that doesn't look right. How did it get wrong? Who do I ask about this? Who do I need to email? Um, what sort of transformation is this? Is this one of those things where people are using 999 to mean NA? Um, and sort of developing that sort of data intuition almost. And from there, I would go on to, uh, you know, statistics, analysis, coding. Um, and, and like I said, I don't think this is usually the, the approach that people recommend, but I really love uh, working through processes like in the same sort of steps that you would once you were, you know, working out there. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's my that's my recommendation. Yeah, I'm glad you you said that. I think you're the first person who said that because like my uh, for example, a lot of my students, my PhD students that uh, that uh, I work with, uh, they all expect uh, the, the, the data sets to be provided <laughs> <laughs> because you know I, I work with quite a few organizations and and they always kind of think that there is this catering service of kind of data supply <laughs> and less data supply <laughs> and uh, yeah and often. Sometimes I say, oh, we actually need to scrape data from mm -hmm. whatever, you know, IMDB or something like this. And, <laughs> and they they all start to scratch their heads and say, oh, you know, I actually don't know how to do that, even if they have, mm -hmm. like, you know, very good technical background. So, um, so yeah, I think that's extremely important. Um, let me just ask you, like, a three questions. So ask you about a person who wants to get um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, into data science and what do, do they have to do? So what if instead of a person, I ask you about a woman who wants to mm -hmm. do that? So what, what, what would you give me the same answer or would your answer change? Uh, I think it would be the same answer. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That's sort of my, my general advice. And also, I mean, there's, um, I think the biggest hurdle for a lot of people in who want to get into data science um, is sort of sticking with it and having that connection to it and that drive that like even because I know a lot of folks that, you know, you have kids, you're working another job, you're trying to get into a second career, maybe you don't have, you know, a lot of time. So finding something that's really motivating to you. I feel once I've connected, collected the data, I want to know what's in there. So mm -hmm. I have sort of like an emotional attachment and I'm like, I want to find out. Um, so yeah, I'd say same. Yeah, it's same, uh, sunk, uh, sunk cost as well because you've, you've yeah. collected all of this. Yeah. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think that's that's definitely cool uh, cool advice because yeah, I remember we once got a uh, got data got data from Twitter, uh, which for, which we paid uh, yeah, you know for which we paid like uh, thousands of do of dollars, and then eventually when we. Um, uh, you know, cleansed the, the, the data, we figured out there are only 20 observations out of like 4 million or something that we could use. Oh. And so that's <laughs> definitely, you know, collecting data is a cool advice. Um, so yeah, uh, I just, I also want to talk to you a little bit about women in STEM and all this. I know that there are, you know, yeah, just, just for, for people who are out there, uh, Rachel and I do appreciate that there are other underrepresented groups and minorities, mm. but like I just want to focus on on, on one group and mm. let's just focus on on, on women for now. Um, so, in your opinion, do we have a lack of female representation in STEM? And the reason why I asked this question because you know several people on this podcast questioned the idea, <laughs> and uh, if so, if if we do have a problem, why do you think this is the case? Like, what are the underlying reasons for this? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I would say certainly based on the fields that I work in, yes, absolutely. Um, I know that in some fields there's much better gender representation. Um, 
I also know that there's a um, pretty strong historical trend where when more women get into a field, it becomes less valued. And as a field becomes more valued, it tends to get more men in it. Um, Except for fashion modeling. Look at that field. <laughs> I mean, this is really cool. I mean, and, and, and I think the salaries for female females in, in, in fashion modeling is a, 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 the salaries are a lot higher for females compared mm. to males. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, Probably, you know, I imagine the mean is higher. I don't know necessarily that the mean is higher. Oh, yeah, that's higher. true. Yeah, yeah. That, that, <laughs> There's that, a lot of exploitation in, yeah, yeah, in that yeah, industry. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, yeah. Um, so something I think about um, quite a lot is, so my mother was actually a, a programmer in my, well, before I was born in the, in the 80s. Um, and... At that time, there was actually a better gender gender balance than there is today in computer programming, um, and especially because it involved um, typing. Mm -hmm. So originally, typing was like a thing that women did. It was not, you know, it wasn't fancy enough for men. Um, and uh, a lot of sort of the the first wave of, of programmers were were women, which I think um, uh, specifically the the Turing Institute is something you're you're very aware of. Um, and then as the field got more and more prestigious, there was like a straight up push to uh, market it as like a field that men did. Um, and along with that, it became, you know, better paying and more prestigious. So I think, I mean, historical reasons, I think there's definitely uh, pressure that has been pressuring, pressuring women specifically out of, out of computer science. Um, and I think there's also... I mean, there's, there's diversity and then there's inclusion, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there mm -hmm. are more pressures trying to remove women, I mean, intentionally or unintentionally from, you know, the, the STEM pipeline than, than men. Um, so just, just specific examples. Um, when, you know, I was hired full time at Google and they're like, oh, we got all these great benefits and we've got, you know, like this lap pool and like cool stuff. Um, they, they did not mention childcare. <laughs> <laughs> at no point was childcare mentioned. Um, and I have, well, I have learned since that there is like one childcare facility in, in Sunnyvale, which is Google headquarters that I think can hold like a hundred children, mm -hmm. um, and has like an enormous waiting list. And, um, Google caters like two to three meals a day, like full hot meals, but childcare is not a priority for them, which is more limiting for the people on whom childcare responsibilities fall, which tend to be, you know, women predominantly. Um, and also I think there's, I mean, particularly in AI, I think in AI, I think there is a, a culture of casual sexism and misogyny that is extremely frustrating. Mm -hmm. Um, so getting the, the, name of uh, the conference now known as NeurIPS changed from NIPS was a huge uphill battle, um, especially uh, Professor Anima Anandkumar mm -hmm. uh, got an enormous, and still gets an enormous amount of gendered abuse for being like, hey, this is a sexist name, and your shirts that say, um, my nips are NP hard are sexist, oh, and this mm -hmm. is like bringing sexual, um, you know, discussion into a professional workplace where it's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I've been in similar situations, so I joined um, a Slack group mm -hmm. that was specifically for, for data scientists, and... After I joined, um, so in Slack, you can react to things with emoji and people can upload custom reaction emoji. Uh, and somebody reacted to something with an emoji that was uh, an anatomically correct penis. <laughs> and oh I come, and I, 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 multiple people had like chosen this reaction emoji and I reached out to the moderator and I was like, excuse me, <laughs> this is inappropriate professional environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and the moderator was like, well, you know, we can't really stop people. And we had some problem with like Nazi images earlier and there's nothing we can really do about it. This was an invite only slack where the moderators abdicated their responsibility to maintain a professional environment um, and it they did it in a way that made me feel like extremely uncomfortable and unwelcome and I just left because the the problem wasn't resolved and I think these sorts of interactions happen constantly and it's not it's clearly not a priority of people in the field to fix this mm. um, or I didn't so my very first interaction with computer vision uh, in graduate school, sorry, in undergraduate, I was really interested in op open source operating systems. And I joined uh, an open source uh, community on, on Google+, which definitely dates this, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the social network that no longer exists. Um, 
And somebody had posted a project that they'd done um, where they trained a very early computer vision thing. So this would have been like 2011, 2012, early, early, um, to rate how attractive a woman was based on a picture of her face and a bunch of his personal ratings of women's attractiveness. And I was like, hey, this is like a discussion group about open source. This makes me feel uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, and like a couple of people were like, yeah, that seems wrong. Maybe, maybe don't do this, dude. Uh, but a bunch of other people were like, well, you can't tell people what to do and what not to do. And I got like verbally harassed and I left the community and I have not worked like in open source operating system sense. I just like left entirely because of this one extremely bad experience when I was, you know, young. I had other things to do. I'm I'm a pretty smart cookie. I had lots of options. And mm-hmm. I was like, this is not worth it. And I bounced. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the and, story, uh, sorry to interrupt you. I, I think, I don't know, I don't know if you um, heard about Jen, Jen Stirrup. Um, so we have this um, person uh, who is very active. So she's very active in AI machine learning. And she was this um, M- MVP. I'm not actually sure what, whether I will get the correct, like you said, like you said, not very good with acronyms, but I think it's it means Microsoft valued uh, person or something like this, mm-hmm. but professional, Microsoft valued professional is, is, is called. So basically that's like a panel that Microsoft gets uh, from different kind of, a lot of different people and then they kind of advise I guess Microsoft on something and um, she basically just left uh, this com- community uh, publicly and uh, for exactly the same reason that you just mm. mentioned that you know um, someone from that community made a completely inappropriate comment um, about her um, and uh, what what really got her was that no one said anything like like a lot of people witnessed uh, the comment but no one said oh you know that was inappropriate and she was writing about how you know this is not (laughs) she doesn't feel safe in uh, in that community so and and that happens like like you said in in, like at at the very high profile you know places like you know i'm I'm sure i'm sure microsoft uh, is is not thrilled that this is happening to that community but yeah i just want to say that the example that you gave is not you're not alone there yeah so it it happens a lot yeah it's not isolated and there is There are definitely people within the community who prioritize making sure that these things don't happen and calling them out and being good allies. Um, But there are also people who genuinely don't care and don't think it's their problem. And predominantly, those people are from, you know, you know, majority groups uh, in the field. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I I will just say, I'm, you know, I'm a nice white lady. (laughs) I do not get a lot of the racial stuff that I know other people are getting Mm -hmm. um, that is just inexcusable. Absolutely inexcusable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, And also considering that uh, there are not many of, you know, uh, uh, people of color, let's just say, Mm -hmm. in, you know, in the profession for for various reasons, especially women, you know, if we take black black women, uh, that's really underrepresented. I had, you know, I, I now have one collaborator <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> who is a, who's a black, black female, um, but like, yeah, it's very, very, very difficult. Um, I, don't, I don't know, maybe maybe in England it's, it's more difficult than in the US, but yeah, certainly like there is a big problem. So um, uh, adjusting to that, <laughs> let's talk <Yeah>. about uh, <laughs> Kegel, being Kegel Grandmaster. So you mm. describe, and I also talked to Parul uh, Pandi, who's another uh, another Kegel, no, Notebooks Kegel Grandmaster, mm-hmm. um, uh, who kind of followed into your footsteps there. Uh, and um, you both describe Kegel as such a great community, like it's very mm-hmm. nice, but still like there are, very few female Kegel grandmasters. So what mm-hmm. is the reason for that? Like, do you think people don't follow through? It's maybe time consuming activity. Like what, like what are the underlying reasons? Because, um, yeah, the, it just uh, seems to be that there is a problem there, despite the fact that there is quite a lot of support probably, you know, from within the community. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think a big part of it is probably just sampling bias mm. like so the the group of people who are interested in ai in the first place who are signing up for kaggle in the first place is you know pretty pretty skewed mm-hmm. um and i think that skewness just sort of continues up through through the the different um you know parts of of the site um but i, w- I will also say just in in general there's um 
Mm. So a big reason that I'm a chiropractic master is I worked there. <laughs> it was my <laughs> full-time job. I had plenty of time to, you know, devote to, to writing good notebooks and uh, helping people out and creating good content. And like major props to people who are doing this is like the, you know, the thing that they do after work. Um, I've, got a, I've got a lot of respect for them. Um, but I think there's also sort of a... Um, I'm, I'm changing the, the subject slightly, but there's less, like a slightly unhealthy... No, I'm just going to reframe this. There's an extremely mm. unhealthy focus in the technology industry in particular on asking people to do work outside of work. Like there's this expectation that like, oh, you're a full-time software engineer. What are your personal coding side projects? What's the work that you do for free outside of work? And I don't think that's uh, fair or healthy to ask people to do. Mm -hmm. um, like I've, I've, you know, I, I enjoy my job. I think I do a pretty good job at it, but like also I got other things going on in my life. I'm not going to go home and, you know, do the exact same thing that I do at work for free when I could, you know, be watering my plants or, you know, exercising or, or spending time with my family. Mm. Um, and I, I think that there's uh, kind of a... Uh, Un unhealthy fixation on just working all the time, which um, makes sense from the employer's point of view, but in terms of like the health and longevity of, of people who are doing the work, I don't think it's necessarily the best thing to push mm. people to do. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we, we, we definitely have lives <laughs> for those yeah. uh, for those who listen. <laughs> if you're listening to this pod podcast and wondering if we, <laughs> we, maybe we don't have better things to do, we do. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, yeah, that, that's it. Um, so, um, yeah. And so another thing that I wanted to ask you, like, I'm really kind of wary of all female events. Um, so what is your take on, 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 on this, on this, like, should we have all female events? Because like, we do have all male events sometimes and all male mm. panels. <laughs> yeah, um, panels, yeah. So, um, so, so do you think that, uh, yeah, so I feel, I don't know whether you have the same feeling. It's kind of like when you go to an all female event, which I, I personally try to avoid, I, I, mm. you know, I would like to see some, some sort of di diversity and inclusion and, and balance. Um, but you know, when you when you go to an all female event, it kind of uh, is kind of niched into you know, uh, and, and people do not take it very seriously. Uh, I think it's, it's kind of like if you have Olympics and you that, that considered to be like para, Paralympics. There's, there's nothing wrong with Paralympics, but um, uh, you know, it's just kind of you know, people say, well, that's completely different uh, selection of people, and uh, you know, the competition is not the same, or you know, the event is not the same. So, what's what's your take on this? Like, should we have all, all female events? And you know, what is like? I, I guess I'm I'm one wondering more how can we make sure that if we have a female event it's taken seriously yeah um uh, yeah so two parts to that so first of all um i'm not a fan of like specifically all female events because i think it's um exclusionary i tend to prefer the term gender minority minorities mm -hmm. um so uh i'm actually uh i was one of the founders of our lady seattle which is a mm -hmm you know, um, women and gender minorities group. Um, and one of the things that we, we talked about from sort of like early on is like NBs are perfectly welcome. And we want to, we want to make this a, a space that's not, you know, just cis women. Yeah. Yeah. Of um, course. Of course. Yeah. 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 No, but I just, um, yeah, yeah. Something we, we, made footnote, <laughs> we made a footnote above that, you know, we, we are not just concerned uh, yeah. about women. Yeah. But when you, you need to start so, somewhere. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so sort of the second part of your question, I, I personally really find uh, sort of women-centered spaces to be very helpful and valuable. Um, and for me, part of that is is definitely technical, just like having a chance to talk shop and uh, uh, not have to deal with, you know, um, just to be, to be perfectly frank, unwanted sexual advances, which happens kind of a lot to me. Um, mm -hmm. And it sucks and it's draining um, and has not happened to me at, you know, primarily, primarily gender minority spaces. So just not having to have that part of my brain, you know, just sort of activated is, I find, mm -hmm. pretty restful and lets me focus more on the technical content. Um, and also just in terms of, of mentorship and career development, I found that I, um, I found that 
you know, gender minority events have been very helpful for me in particular. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in fields where there is a pretty strong imbalance in, um, you know, makeup on any sort of demographic scale, having a space for people from a minority group to sort of just be with each other and, and focus on things uh, is really reinforces the idea that you are, you belong in this field and there are other people who are in the same boat as you. So, um, uh, other organizations, so widening NLP and NLP, um, I Mm -hmm. think is a, a great, um, a great organization. Black and AI, I think is great. Uh, Pi Ladies, Our Ladies, I'm a big fan. Um, and I would, uh, never invite myself to a Black and AI event. Like if somebody wanted me to be there for a specific reason, I'd, I'd be happy to, to show up and help, but it's not a space for me. Um, and I'm, you know, very okay with that. Um, so I think different people get different things out of them. Um, how do we get people to take them seriously? Well, I mean, at some point, people who don't take them seriously are going to be the people who just don't take women seriously. And that's not something that you can fix externally in somebody mm-hmm. else. Um, and like, there's no good answer to that, right? Yeah, so <laughs> just, I, just uh, when, you were talking, when you were talking, I was just looking up mm-hmm. this quote from uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg. Remember, Justice mm-hmm. Ginsburg said that, uh, they said, oh, when will, will you be uh, happy with kind of gender balance in Supreme Court? And she said, when there are all women in Supreme Court. <laughs> and, uh, and everybody went like, what? And uh, she said, well, we had all men, <laughs> all male <laughs> Supreme Court. Like, why not like the other way around? So yeah, I guess I guess it's also you know the yeah reaching that uh, yeah so like I guess I guess what what I'm not um, when I'm what I'm not finding helpful uh, is hmm. when it's it's really structured as non-diverse and non-inclusive event mm. or whatever competition you know that's what we're focusing on and we're not allowing you know <laughs> anybody else so i guess i guess what that's 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 what that's that's what the problem is but yeah in terms of yeah making it more uh more res- respected by the community would be a like it's a big task <laughs> something that we need to think about um so yeah that's here's another trick question for you uh, that I wanted to ask um so you are often uh, called the first female not- notebooks kegel grand- grandmaster so um like I would be like very um concerned <laughs> if someone called me the first female behavioral data science professor <laughs> you know, so that would be um strange <laughs> so how do you how do you feel about carrying this kind of this female uh, bit in your title is that something mm-hmm. that you think is good and kind of sets good example and do you act as a role model to others who maybe you know thinking that you know I would like to do this but not sure um, or is it something that you think you would rather kind of drop from the title <laughs> <laughs> yeah um yeah so this is it's interesting so this is something that's people have only sort of brought up to me after I've left Kaggle, which I suppose makes sense because um, when you're a Kaggle employee, you don't show up in the rankings. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's sort of like once I left, I showed up in the rankings. Um, I I got mixed feelings about it. Because on the one hand, again, I did work there. So my sort of like path to to grand mastery was not the usual path to grand mastery. Um, On the other hand, people who also work there doing very similar things didn't, for one reason or another, end up being grandmasters. So I think it is, um, I will always be um, just very grateful that the Kaggle community genuinely found my content helpful and worth, you know, sharing and saving. Um, And I, uh, like I said, it's it's a great community and, and being, you know, recognized by people in it is, is always, um, going to be a, a source of, you know, professional pride for me. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, mm-hmm. it's hard to, I mean, I, I can't divorce myself from my gender. Um, and I wouldn't want to, um, and I would hope that people would recognize me as an individual before they're like, oh, a woman, particularly in a, in a community that I'm an active member of, well, mm-hmm. activist member of. Um, it doesn't bother me especially, um, but I think I would prefer for it to be like, um, 
I would prefer to be associated with like specific things that I've done mm-hmm. rather than just sort of like generally, oh, Rachel, the woman. <laughs> it's like a little bit weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we talked a, l- a little bit more about uh, diversity and inclusion, but, you know, mm-hmm. just, just a kind of general question about, like, what can we do to make things better on that front? Mm-hmm. Like, you've, you've, you've already uh, talked about, you know, some examples of what, what, what happens, but, like, yeah, in terms of what can we do? Like, w- w- maybe you've seen something that worked well in some environments that so you could kind of think as a good example of <laughs> of diverse and inclusive policy so yeah yeah definitely um so i think a very big thing that every community should do whether it's online or in person um i know that you can't see on the podcast but i'm wearing a, a pie cascade <laughs> shirt and i think the pie cascades did a really good job of this um is have a code of conduct tell people about the code of conduct and then enforce it. And if people violate the code of conduct, um, there should be consequences. They should be removed from the event. They should be removed from the community. Um, and people should feel that um, they have recourse. So in the example that I gave with the, you know, the mm-hmm. penis reaction emoji, um, when I, I brought it up, like I feel like that would be pretty much against the code of conduct of um, certainly any community, uh, any of the other communities that I was involved in at that time. Um, not being able to have community standards that you genuinely stick to and that you decide that you're going to stick to beforehand um, disincentivizes people who would be marginalized uh, from joining your community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so let me just ask you maybe follow up a little bit, a slight mm-hmm. follow up to that. So there is, um, um, I think the, the uh, one of the major problems is uh, like we couldn't find anybody. Uh, so the, mm. that's 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 the excuse of people. I mean, we, can't, we just couldn't find anybody. So we uh, I, we had a a major thing recently with um, there is this kind of engineering kind of top prof- like high profile uh, design design engineering conference, and um, they had like very very low like I think there were either no women or like barely like any women in there, mm-hmm. and uh, some people brought it up to the attention of the conference organizers and the, the main conference our organizer said we just don't have like qualified people with PhDs who are also representatives of you know underrepresented groups of minorities which kind of <laughs> kind of snowballed into this big <laughs> big outroar like are you serious? So, yeah. So how do we make sure that I, I, I guess like, you know, there's also a problem that not only like, like you said, that there is like inappropriate behavior, but also like, mm-hmm. how do you get noticed um, in, you know, in, 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 the, in, in these contexts? Because, yeah. you know, people just, I think the, the biggest excuse that I, 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 I always hear is that, like, we just couldn't find, like, we couldn't find, like, um, uh, you know, for example, a black female uh, with a PhD. And I just, I just think, well, that's kind of seems strange to me because I'm sure there are people <laughs> representing that specific group with PhDs, right? Yeah. Um, I would say look harder. (laughs) So uh, there's, uh, you know, a lot of people put together resources of, um, you know, say minority speakers, um, female speakers with their expertise in in various areas. They're extremely easy to find on your search engine of choice. Um, And particularly if you're working in a field that's very skewed and you're, you know, putting together an event, be aware of that and be like, hey, I noticed that I put together, you know, a list of eight people and they're all white dudes. Um, Surely there's someone else who would be, you know, qualified and interesting to hear from who I just haven't considered. Um, So there's um, social networks tend to be fairly homogenous, particularly in, um, you know, if the larger group is homogenous, your socials, your small social network is also very likely to be homogenous. Mm. Um, so, like, go look. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I think you know, I, I can tell like my my, my take on this, and uh, I don't know whether you would agree with me. So, I decided that I will actually have an inclusion rider from now mm. on. So, every time I work on a project, like I'm commissioned to do a project, I ask like, you know, I want to work with uh, a diverse group. And um, every time I speak at a conference, I now also ask, you know, I want to see some diversity in panels before I agree. So, and I think if we all do that, maybe (laughs) that then, you know, the organizers and people in in, in various organizations will look harder. 
Yeah, definitely. And it's not that the qualified people aren't there. It's that you aren't thinking about them right now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So obviously we cannot, so we've talked about diversity, so um, uh, mm-hmm. I cannot uh, not ask you about COVID <laughs> because <laughs> it has been such a big deal this year. Mm. Um, so um, what do you think about like the data science and AI con- kind of contribution to solving the current issues that COVID brought up like do we should we get involved or should we mm. stay away from this mm-hmm. and let epidemiologists do what they need to do so what's your take on this like what what are, is, is there any value in data science yeah. in this context i think there's the potential to help i think there is a greater potential to harm and i don't think if you are not an epidemiologist if you are not a public health expert you should take point on the project so um i'm all for um using you know, AI tools to assist. But if I think AI with like a lot of fields tend to have, I don't know, have you ever heard of the term engineer's disease? Mm -hmm. It's like engineers are like, we solve problems. Therefore, (laughs) we will be able to solve this problem uh, when there are already people working on solving the problem and you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You can go ask them if they need your help. And if they say no, you should be like, okay, and not help. Um, Particularly, a lot of the projects have been, um, especially the contact problem tracing problems have been, um, many of them have proposed in such a way that they have serious privacy concerns. Yeah. Um, and I think just sort of <laughs> uncritically building something to figure out who somebody's friends are, or, you know, to sort of like geofencing, um, and identifying individuals has clear se- privacy and security, um, and ethical issues and the yeah. motivational, like I, I, for example, as a behavioral scientist, I don't see why anybody would want, like, you know, yeah, you can say to people, you, you should do it for the greater good. But like, if you mm. don't create like proper motivation for people to do it, I mean, that's just, yeah. <laughs> um, so let's just kind of zoom, zoom out a little bit on, on this mm. and, um, and talk about just the future of data science uh, in mm-hmm. general. So where do you think we we will be in the next five years, like what would be the hot topics? Mm. I mean, obviously conversational AI will be a hot topic, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Well, maybe. There are, I would say like as somebody who works in conversational AI, there are a fairly limited number of good applications. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think everything should be a conversational AI. I think things that are already fairly good to do via conversation should be a conversational AI. Um, So like scheduling, fairly good thing for conversational AI. Picking color swatches, why? Why would you do that? Don't do that. That's a bad choice. Um, Yeah, so putting on sort of my Nostradamus hat, um, big things that I think are going to come up, absolutely legislation. I think we're going to see more legislation uh, restricting and guiding AI applications and, and what will and won't be um, allowable. And hopefully uh, practitioners will have a seat at the table um, because we, you know, have the, the background to say, um, you know, what is and isn't feasible. Um, I think that's definitely going to be something. Uh, I think also the sort of... Uh, bifurcation of the field is probably going to continue. So there's, um, I would say, an increasing gulf between more machine learning engineers and uh, analytic data sciences, the scientists that I think is going to increase. Um, not necessarily a bad thing. I just think the the roles are becoming more specialized. The background knowledge you need is increasing in, in sort of all of these, these places. So I think that there's going to be um, m- less heterogeneity in the field. So when you see the title data scientist, you're going to have a better idea of what you would be doing in that role. Um, And uh, also, I think that we're going to see, I hope, this is just me hoping, I hope we're (laughs) going to see a big focus on smaller, more portable, more ecologically friendly to train models. Mm -hmm. Um, So big trend right now is bigger, bigger, bigger. So in in, uh, NLP, the GPT-3 models are Mm-hmm. enormous t5 etc um and uh like as a as a practitioner <laughs> somebody else like put stuff into production i'm like that's too big don't <laughs> uh chimney cricket i don't want that um so i'm really hoping that we'll see more of a focus on small efficient easy to train models the, the work just is good uh, yeah so 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 yeah definitely i think you mentioned several really exciting things that i would uh, really prefer to see 
Um, yeah, and um, let's see what legislation will look like. <laughs> Hopefully, it will not prevent us do um, a lot of things that we want to do, but at the same time, will be constructive, you know, in protecting uh, people's privacy. So that's definitely the balance that I, I would be hoping for. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we're almost at the end of the interview, and I just have two two more questions for you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and so the first question is like, tell, can you tell us what are you currently working on? What makes you excited? What keeps you awake at night? <laughs> um, yeah, so things that I'm working on currently um, is uh, Kubernetes. I'm <laughs> oh, learning so much more than I ever wanted to know about container orchestration, and it's just. Uh, not really, my background isn't really in DevOps and I'm, I am experiencing a period of growth. <laughs> uh, and I think that's one of the things that keeps me up at night is like, oh gosh, which one is the, uh, I can't even think of a, a good word right now that I'm thinking about. Um, things that keep me up at night, definitely, um, ethics, applications, people building things that have a clear application that is harmful and mm. maybe fewer or none ones that are good. Um, so I have a talk coming up at, I think it'll probably be after this, this airs, I think it'll probably be before this airs rather at widening NLP on, on what I personally won't build and sort of my, um, uh, evolving personal ethical engineering standards around, around systems. Uh, things that I'm really excited about, um, Sorry, I'm thinking. <laughs> That's okay. No, I yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I'm glad that you are, you know, you have this uh, kind of uh, personal barometer in terms of ethics. Mm -hmm. Like I, yeah, I myself also, like we sometimes uh, kind of curb a lot of ideas because we're thinking, oh God, I mean, this could be used <laughs> in this way. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, yeah, the, the, the example that I gave uh, recently is, uh, you know, we, we were trying to, so we have a big problem with um, homelessness in in. Mm -hmm. In, in in London and uh, yeah there are a lot of people in sub-zero temperatures who were sleeping mm -hmm. outside and we wanted to make an app that would kind of identify people um, mm -hmm. in the streets and then uh, you know th this would give the kind of information to the shelters so that like volunteers could come out and actually help uh, you know uh, but then we were thinking how you know this this <laughs> this bit of tech could be could be used <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then we decided well you know maybe maybe the best thing is to drive <laughs> to drive a truck <laughs> and see <laughs> and look or bus you know and, and, and see and look for people so I think that I think yeah so that's that's kind of the I, I, I'm here I, I'm, I'm there with you and um, very few <laughs> people actually on this podcast are willing to kind of discuss ethics because mm. um, yeah so it's, it's great that you're thinking about it um, so let me, let's just go to the last question. And this is a question that everybody complains about. And you as a linguist <laughs> with a PhD will complain about it even more than anybody else, I'm sure. <laughs> we'll see. But yeah, so the question is, if I ask you to recommend one book, just one book mm -hmm. and one film, what would your recommendations be? Uh one book and one field or and, a book in one uh, field? Uh, so uh, one book and one film. Uh, one uh, movie. movie. Oh, film? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, movie. Okay. Um, I mean, I think the most relevant book for uh, this audience would be, let me look up the title so I say it correctly. It's by Manning and Nolis. No, that's okay. It's good. Uh, yeah. The book that I would recommend would be Build a Career in Data Science by Emily Robinson and Jacqueline Nollis. Mm -hmm. um, Emily and Jacqueline are both fantastic data scientists. Um, they have fantastic advice. If you're interested in getting into the field, I would highly recommend uh, that book. Um, and film... Uh, uh, one sec, let me look up the title of this as yeah, well. No, what is that? Should I prepare this? Maybe. <laughs> Yeah, don't worry, don't worry about this too much. Like everybody, like when I ask this question, everybody says, "Oh, you know, it's very difficult to pick one." It's <laughs> so, uh, obviously if you read more than one book and watched more than one film, that's a tough, tough question to answer. Uh, 
Um, the film that I would recommend is not data science related at all. I just think it's real cool. It's um, Light on Earth by David Attenborough. It's mm -hmm. a documentary about bioluminescence. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, <laughs> Rachel. This was such a pleasure to talk to you today. And we, uh, I think, covered a lot of different topics. And uh, uh, yeah, I just hope that, uh, you know, things work out the way you want. And uh, um, just want to say thank you so much for doing this and good luck with everything that you are doing. It's uh, amazing. And uh, I, I'm just, I'm really... Uh, hoping that everything that you are doing will realize <laughs> in the future. <laughs> yeah, that's that would be fantastic. Um, and thank you for having me. This was fun. Well, mostly it was fun. It was also <laughs> important. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you.